campaign in 1992, of course, emphasized three principles of his foreign policy, economics, national security, and the promotion of democracy. And he has done that in every major speech that he has made since then, and he has made that a centerpiece of his foreign policy. He has suggested uh, or implied on numerous occasions that uh, that is a substitute for an approach of uh, global stability through accommodations, such as accommodation with China, uh, the long rationale of the so-called realists uh, for uh, in the pursuit of a stable international order. And uh, the President has implied a somewhat different approach and occasionally has specifically spelled out a different approach. Uh, that is controversial within the uh, study of international politics and among practitioners. And this evening we have with us Dr. Morton Halperin, who, uh, as well as anyone, is prepared to articulate the importance of the promotion of democracy in the world and the various ways in which that and a more uh, sane international order might be promoted. Uh, so I think it's an extraordinarily e exciting evening uh, in the sense that one uh, uh, should get closer to the intellectual rationale behind what is, in fact, I believe, an innovative foreign policy. Um, I'll take a second longer than usual in reading Dr. Halpern's chronology, simply because it's of great interest to many of you. B.A., Columbia University, Ph.D., Yale in International Relations, 60 to 66, assistant professor at Harvard and a research associate in the Harvard Center for International Affairs. 66 to 69, a deputy assistant secretary of defense, international security affairs, and uh, responsible in the area of political military planning and arms control. 1969, a senior staff member of the National Security Council and 69 to 73, a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. 74, with the 20th Century Fund, in charge of a project on government secrecy. 75 to 92, director of the Center for National Security Studies. 84 to 92, director of the ACLU in Washington. 92 to 94, a senior associate with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And in 1993, a consultant to the Secretary of Defense and the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, and he was nominated by the President for the position of Assistant Secretary of Defense for Democracy and Peacekeeping. 94 to 96, he served as the Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for Democracy at the National Security Council. He has also been since then a senior fellow with the Council on Foreign Relations in Washington, and he now is the Vice President of the 20th Century Fund. Of course, we're deeply interested in uh, the latter part of the career and his interest in democracy. Let me note, in terms of just his enormous credentials, he's authored and co-authored and edited more than a dozen books including Bureaucratic Politics and Foreign Policy in 74, Nuclear Fallacy in 87, Self-Determination and the World Order in 92. His articles have been on subjects including national security and civil liberties, bureaucratic politics, Japan, China, military strategy, and arms control. He's taught at several universities, presently teaches at George Washington University, and among his impressive awards is a five-year MacArthur Fellowship. The topic tonight, as I said, is uh, how to make stolen elections, such as those in Haiti, an international crime. This effort suggests uh, the embodiment of the rudiments of democracy and non-authoritarian government uh, in an enforceable and enlightened international uh, law and international order. He's an intellectual leader of the movement for democratization as the basis of a more stable and enlightened world order. Uh, 
I look forward with tremendous interest, and I know that you do as well, to his remarks. It's my enormous pleasure to present to you Dr. Morton Halpern. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here. I have to say, I've spoken many places and many different times. I've never seen an audience seat itself with such discipline. It's really, it's really, quite, uh, it's really quite impressive. Um, the, um, I appreciated very much the introduction. It actually left out what I claim is my unique claim to fame. I am, as far as I'm aware, the only person who holds both the Department of Defense Distinguished Civilian Service Award and the Playboy Foundation First Amendment Award. <laughs> the, um, I want to talk this evening about a movement towards uh, a greater role in the international community in trying to uh, promote democracy around the world. And as you heard in the introduction, the President has made clear that the effort to expand the r number of countries that have democratic governments is an integral part of the foreign policy of the United States, not because we seek to impose our values on others, but because we believe, as the UN announced many years ago when it adopted the Declaration uh, of universal rights, that all people want to live and are entitled to live in democratic societies. But, and our interest in this also is related to our security and our economic prosperity, because we have found that democratic governments are more likely to cooperate, both in building an effective international trade system and in cooperating to prevent uh, violence and to promote cooperative security. There is a great debate, as you may know, among political scientists about whether democratic states never go to war with each other. And there have been various studies done to demonstrate that it has never been the case that two democratic states have gone to war. Now, some people have suggested that this is because political scientists, when they see two countries fighting, redefine one of them as not being democratic <laughs> so that the results always come out right. And somebody else has suggested that the real reason that two democratic states have never gone to war is that up till now there have been so few democratic states that they have not had an opportunity to go to war with each other. So we're about to test that absolute proposition, but I think it's clear to all of us that democratic states are less likely to go to war and less likely, in particular, to go to war uh, with each other. And I'd be uh, pleased in the question period to talk more about this sort of general philosophical point. I want to focus my remarks, however, on one aspect of the worldwide effort to promote democracy. And I want to do that by starting uh, with a clause of the American Constitution, which I think provides the intellectual underpinnings uh, for this issue. And it's a clause in the Constitution that gets very little attention. It's something called the Guarantee Clause. The Guarantee Clause of the American Constitution says that the United States shall guarantee to each state in the Union a Republican form of government. And the clause is unique among the clauses of the Constitution in that it is the only clause which imposes an obligation on the central government. The rest of the Constitution talks about the rights of the central government. It says the Congress shall have the power to do X or the President shall have the power to do Y, but it does not say that it must do it. And this power is conferred not on the Congress, not on the President, but on the government as a whole. And it says the government of the United States shall guarantee to each state a Republican form of government. Now, what that meant was that the central government had an obligation to intervene in the states to prevent the creation of a monarchy or a dictatorship of some kind and to ensure what we would now call constitutional democracy, that is, a government of limited powers 
uh, based on the sovereignty of the people, the conduct of, of periodic free and fair elections. And the framers of the Constitution impose that obligation on the central government because they believed that states that were democratic could live together in peace, but that you could not have a community of states, some of which were democratic and some of which were monarchies and authoritarian governments, and still have the kind of harmony that they wanted among the states and to have the kind of trade relations among the states that they had. And they also recognized that there was always a danger of tyranny that there was a danger that the people in a moment of exuberance would vote to end their Republican form of government, or that people who happened to control the military power in the society would use military force to unseat the democratic government. And so they decided the way to protect the democracies that were developing in each of the 13 states uh, was to assign the responsibility to the central government to be sure that democracy continued to flourish in the individual countries. And that, of course, has been the tradition. There have actually been a few cases in our history, particularly in the early period, when the military forces of the central government were sent to ensure uh, that democracy had taken root in the states. Now, by contrast to that, the tradition in the international system has been very different until very recently. The tradition in the international system was to say that it was the responsibility of each society, of each nation, to decide what kind of government it had. And whether or not there had been a democratic election, the international community's attitude to a change in government, even a military coup or use of forced to change a government was to say that it was the concern only of the people on the territory of the nation involved. And the international community simply asked two questions. Is the new government have effective control over the territory uh, on which the, of the country? And have they committed themselves to honor their international obligations, the treaty obligations that they had made to other states. And if those two conditions were met, the United States and all other countries routinely recognized a new government, even if that government came to power as a result of a military coup against the democratically elected government. Now, as I want to suggest, we've come very far, really, in the last 10 years or so from that situation. And I think in some ways, as we, when we look back and write the history of this extraordinary change in our attitude towards the protection of democratic governments on the part of the international community, we will see in the end that we end up with something like uh, the guarantee clause of the American Constitution. And I want to talk a little bit about how I think we ought to get there. But I think also, as we write that intellectual, the history of this development, one of the turning points will be an event that I think many of you will remember, namely the coup, the military coup that took place in the Soviet Union, seeking to remove Gorbachev from power because of the fear that he was moving what was then the Soviet Union inexorably towards establishing some form of democratic government and ending the one-party rule of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union. And if you remember that day, uh, many of us turned on our TV sets to hear reports. Uh, we were subjected, and this was one of the first times that CNN really broadcast to many people around the world live uh, events as they were incurring of momentous importance. And the, it was announced that there had been a coup, that Gorbachev had been removed from power. And the first reaction of the American government, first statement by George Bush reflected the traditional approach to this issue. He said that if the new leaders effectively control the country and if they agree to honor their international obligations, and he referred specifically to the various arms control treaties in Europe, then he said the United States would recognize and deal with this new government. But there was around the world an outpouring of concern and determination not to permit that to happen. And three or four hours later, the President was back on television saying something very different, 
saying that the United States would not accept the coup, that it would not tolerate this new government, that we recognized the existing constitutional order as fragile and as new as it was in the Soviet Union. And the success there uh, it will be, as it always is, primarily with the people of their own society who are struggling to establish democracy. But I think this changed attitude of the international community played an important role in Yeltsin's rallying, you remember, around uh, the White House in Moscow and the movement which has now led to uh, the beginnings of a, and the taking root of a democracy in Russia and at least some of the other former republics in the Soviet Union. Well, that event, I think, signaled a beginning of a fundamental change in attitude. And we see it now becoming institutionalized in a number of different places, primarily in Europe uh, and in, uh, in the Western Hemisphere, but also to some degree more generally around the world. In Europe, the uh, what was originally called the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe, and what is now called the Organization on Security and Cooperation in Europe, has adopted the principle that the only legitimate form of government, at least in Europe, is a democratic government. That the countries that are members of that uh, organization commit themselves both to main the, maintain democracy in their own country, but also to intervene when necessary to help promote and protect democracy in other countries within the region. And while this process is far from perfect, you see it occurring uh, in in Serbia when there was a dispute about the local elections, most recently in Albania uh, when there was a disputed election and the uh, Organization for Cooperation and Security sent in observers and a team which in effect insisted uh, that there be a free and fair election in that region. And I think the countries of Europe now understand that if you want to be part of Europe, you need to be democratic and that the European community of organizations has, a, has taken on some responsibility for responding uh, when there is a threat to democracy. This process is most formalized uh, within the Western Hemisphere in the Organization of American States, in which there is something called the Santiago Declaration, in which, again, the states in the region have proclaimed that the only legitimate form of government, again, at least in the Western Hemisphere, is a democratic form of government and proclaim that it is the responsibility of the OAS to intervene and to respond when there is what they call a sudden and unexpected interruption of the democratic process, or in English, a military coup against an established democratic government. Now, as you know, in Latin America, there has been a tradition of military coups against democratically elected governments. And the attitude in the OAS as a whole uh, was to say that that was an internal affair. And the fundamental principle of the OAS was that no state or group of states interfered in the internal affairs of other countries in the hemisphere. So we saw military coups in many countries that were long established democracies, and the rest of the hemisphere simply accepted it <coughs> and recognized the new government. The attitude of the United States ranged from accepting this along with everybody else, and in some cases actually encouraging and financing the coup and assuring the coup plotters that when they came to power, that the United States would recognize them and provide assistance to them. That has all changed. The rule in the hemisphere now is that only democratic governments will be tolerated. And of course, every government in the hemisphere but Cuba now has at least some form of a democratic government, governments that have been elected in relatively free and fair elections and which are committed to periodic renewal of their mandate through an election. There is, in most countries of the hemisphere, a relatively free press um, and the right of political organizations to operate. Now, that does not mean that there is a perfect human rights record in any country in the hemisphere, but it does mean that they are all moving towards uh, democratic government. And 
from the point of view of my subject for this evening, what is now clear is that the other countries of the hemisphere will intervene if there is an attempt at a coup, whether the coup is by the military or by the elected ruler of the country to try to suspend or eliminate the democratic process. And while those interventions have not always been totally successful, they have now occurred in a number of states, in Peru with somewhat less success than in other places, in Guatemala where a coup by an elected uh, president was turned back because of the vigorous intervention in the OAS and in other countries in Paraguay and Ecuador, threats and rumors of military coups have been headed off by the clear indication that the Organization of American States would not tolerate it, that the country would be suspended, that sanctions would be imposed on them, uh, and that uh, a country cannot be part of the growing economic integration in the hemisphere unless it has a democratically elected government. And of course, in the Western Hemisphere, the most important example of the changing international attitude was what occurred in Haiti. You remember that uh, after many years of turmoil, a, there was finally an interim government in Haiti which announced its determination to conduct a free and fair election. It invited the OAS and the UN to send observers to monitor the election. Those two international bodies did so. There were a number of private observers in the country. The presidential election took place, and to the surprise of many people, except apparently not to many Haitians, Aristide was elected president of the country in what everybody understood to be a free and fair election. Now, that did not mean that there was a perfect democracy in Haiti. Nobody suggests that. But there was in power somebody who had come to power for the first time and was effectively ruling the country after a, an election which had been certified by the OAS and the UN to be a free and fair election. Sometime after that, there was a military coup. The OAS met in emergency session and announced that it would not permit the coup to stand. The then American Secretary of State, James Baker, went to that meeting and said the United States will not permit this coup to stand. Well, it turned out to take much longer and to be much more difficult than anybody imagined uh, for that pledge to be fulfilled. Sanctions were initially applied. They turned out not to do much good. There were various efforts to negotiate a change in the government. And when those efforts all failed, the Clinton administration went to the United Nations Security Council and asked the Security Council, with the support of Aristide, to pass a resolution under what's called Chapter 7, which is the part of the UN Charter which authorizes the Security Council to use military force when necessary to promote international peace and security. And for the first time, and what I think will be looked back as a milestone event in the establishment of the rule of law and the protection of democracy by the international community. The Security Council authorized states to use all necessary means, which are the magic words meaning including the use of military force, to intervene in Haiti to remove from de facto power uh, a group of people who happen to control the only uh, two tanks and one anti-personnel weapon in Haiti, and to restore to power uh, the government that had been elected in a democratic election. Uh, based on that resolution, the United States assembled a group of states willing to act. Uh, you remember then at the very last minute, President Carter led a delegation to Haiti which negotiated with the de facto rulers and persuaded them to step aside peacefully. The force landed. Uh, Aristide was restored to power. Uh, sometime after that, the United States turned the responsibility for security in Haiti over to a UN peacekeeping force, which remains in Haiti to this day. Its, its mandate will shortly expire. And under the, pre with the presence of the UN force, Haiti, for the first time in its history, saw a second democratic election and the peaceful transfer of power from one democratically elected leader to another. Now, the history of Haiti is not over, uh, and it is not clear how 
uh, strong the democracy will be that survives in that country. But for the point of view of what I'm talking about this evening, you saw for the first time the international community saying, we will not tolerate a military coup against a democratically elected government. And at least in some situations, the Security Council will authorize the use of military force to ensure the reestablishment of the democratically elected government. Now, as I suggested, you've begun to see the spread of that approach throughout the world. Uh, I think there is no question, for example, if there were to be a military coup uh, in South Korea, that the international community would respond in a way that really forecloses that possibility. Indeed, if you talk to people in South Korea, they will tell you that their history of military coups is over, uh, that they have a democratically elected government, uh, and that that government will survive. Indeed. Uh, we may see shortly the election in Korea of Kim Dae-jung, a man who's been in opposition for 30 years. 20 years ago, 10 years ago, even five years ago, if he was on the verge of being elected, you would have an announcement from the military that if he were to win the election, he would not be permitted to take office. It is now clear that if he is elected, he will take office. Part of that is a very changed attitude among the people of Korea, but part of that is, I think, an understanding on the part of the military in Korea that if they tried to carry out a coup, they would get not the support of the United States, which they would have gotten 15 years ago, but the opposition of the United States and the international community as a whole. And you see that now in Africa. And I think beginning in southern Africa, you now have a group of democratic states which are creating a democratic community in southern Africa. And even throughout Africa, you have now some response, not always as effective as one would hope, to military coups against democratically elected government. Indeed, you even have the rather bizarre situation in which the government of, uh, of Nigeria, which is a military government which came in and disposed a democratically elected government, sending its troops to intervene in other African countries to try to overturn military coups against democratically elected governments. And I've not found anybody who can explain to me exactly what they think they're up to in supporting this principle uh, of democratically elected governments. But you may have seen in the last few days the, the British Commonwealth, which still exists, uh, met um, and spent most of its time debating what to do about Nigeria. Now again, under the old standard, it's got a functioning government. It's clearly in control of its territory. It honors all of its international obligations. And yet the Commonwealth has made it clear that if there is not a reestablishment of democratic government and a free election, that that country will be suspended from the Commonwealth. And it may well go to the Security Council and ask the Security Council to impose greater sanctions. So you're seeing a spread of this attitude, um, most recently in Albania, where the Security Council for the second time authorized a Chapter 7 military operation for the purpose of supervising and monitoring a free election uh, in Albania. Now, what I want to suggest that the time has come to think about codifying uh, this process in a more formal way. And for the democratic states that now exist in the world to come together and to uh, draft and then ratify and put into effect a covenant on the protection of democratically elected governments. And the notion would be uh, to establish it as an international crime to steal a democratic election and to focus the efforts to deter and to punish this event on the individuals who carry it out rather than on the regime that comes into power. Up until now, our focus has been on the new regime that comes into power as a result 
of a military coup. And if you look at the sanctions that have been imposed, in, that were imposed in Haiti, for example, that are discussed for Nigeria, for Burma, for other countries where there has been a military coup against the democratic government, what's generally talked about are sanctions against the government and the country where there is the military dictatorship. And people have pointed out correctly that these sanctions tend to hurt not the people who carried out the coup, but the citizens of the country who are already hurting from the fact that a coup was conducted that deprived them of a democratic election. And so what I think we need to do is to turn our attention to the coup perpetrators and to make it clear to them that anybody who carries out a coup against a democratically elected government is carrying out a crime which is going to be punished by the international community. Uh, and I think that the, the focus needs to be, at least for the short run, on the immediate period of an election, on an attempt to prevent people who have won a democratic election from taking office, uh, as took place in Burma, for example, or to remove a democratically elected leader from office after he assumes office, as took place in Haiti. And that the democratic states that sign such a convention should commit themselves to imposing sanctions not on the country, but on the perpetrators of the coup. For example, to seize their assets abroad uh, and to deprive them of the use of their assets. To deny them visas to travel to other countries. To deny their spouses uh, and family members visas to travel to other countries to deny them the right to send their children to schools in other countries. And if you look at the people who carry out these military coups and what they're interested in, you will see that these kinds of sanctions, in fact, strike at uh, what a lot of them are, in fact, interested in. And then, if necessary, to impose other kinds of sanctions that strike at their ability to govern rather than at the society as the whole. And at the same time, to move towards holding them liable in a criminal court uh, for the crime that they have committed of stealing a democratic election. As you know, there are uh, efforts underway now in the United Nations finally to bring into existence an international criminal court, which would be responsible for trying people who commit serious international crimes and crime against humanity. As you know, there is now a specific court functioning to deal with the former Yugoslavia and a second court to deal with Rwanda, and now discussions are underway about creating a new ad hoc tribunal to try to bring Popat before an international court to try him for his crimes against humanity in Cambodia. But the UN is also actively debating, and there will be an international conference in Rome next year to finally create a covenant which would bring into existence an international criminal court which would have the jurisdiction to try people who commit genocide, um, serious war crimes, and other crimes against humanity. And my proposal is that once this international court comes into existence, that it would be given the additional jurisdiction to try those who uh, carried out the crime of stealing a democratic election. Now, this would obviously not necessarily mean that in every case the international community could or should mount a military operation to seize the people. But at the very least, it would mean that people who carried out a coup to overturn a democratically elected government would know that they had to spend the rest of their lives in their own country. Because if they left and went to any other country, uh, the police in that country would be obliged under international law to seize them and to turn them over to this international court uh, to be cried, tried for the crime of stealing an international election. Well, let me um, say a few things about uh, the objections that uh, can be raised to this uh, proposal, try to head off some of your questions, uh, but then I'll be happy to answer these and others in more detail. Um, this proposal does not deal with every problem of promoting democratic society. It does not deal with the cases where there is no 
democracy at all, whether it's China or Saudi Arabia or any other countries, which unfortunately have not reached the point uh, where the people of that country have gotten the power to hold a democratic election. It does not deal with a growing problem of the failure to conduct a free and fair election, of countries which pretend to hold free and fair elections but then do things to reduce the role of the opposition, to deny them access to media, so that the election which is held is in fact not a free and fair election. It does not deal with the problem of the gradual erosion of democracy after an elect democratic election takes place. But it does deal with, in my view, one of the fundamental problems that we've seen in the effort to consolidate democratic regimes, namely the use of force by a small group to prevent the evolution of the democratic process. Now, some people say this is imposing Western values um, on other societies. Uh, and my view is that that's simply wrong. I've never found anybody who wants to be tortured. I've never found anybody who doesn't believe that he or she should be allowed to state their political views uh, and seek office. Now, it's true that when people get into office, they torture, they deny other people those rights. Uh, but nobody espouses that as a norm. And if you talk to Aung San Suu Kyi, the elected leader of Burma, who's been denied the right to take office, if you talk to the people in Korea, who have struggled to establish a democratic government there, if you talk to the people of Mongolia, who peacefully and quickly established the democratic regime overthrowing a communist government, if you talk to the people of Albania, which we always was, were told was a dark and mysterious country in which Western civilization did not penetrate, if you talk to leaders throughout the world, if you talk to many people in China, I think you will find it hard to argue that these are not universal values. Now, that does not mean that every country needs to have a Senate Foreign Relations Committee with a chairman who can deny the president the right to make diplomatic appointments. It does not mean that our rather peculiar separation of powers is a necessary element of a democratic society. But there are some basic fundamental principles, free and fair elections, the right to speak and organize political opposition, an independent judiciary, the right to be free of torture and arbitrary arrest, which I would argue are universal values. They're embodied in universal declarations and universal covenants, uh, and that seeking to promote those around the world is not imposing Western values on other societies. Uh, now, there are difficult questions about how to define when a free election took place and how to distinguish between a military coup against a democratic government um, and an uprising against tyranny. This country did start with the Declaration of Independence, and I think we all continue to believe that uh, when faced with tyranny, people have the right to overthrow uh, that tyranny and to institute a new government based on the consent of the government. And then, so we need to be sure that in creating international institutions and mechanisms to defend democratic governments, that we are defending democratic governments and not tyranny. But I think those problems can be solved as we move along, and that we are reaching a point now um, when just as the people who created this nation said that they wanted to live not in simply in individual states that were democratic, but they wanted to live in a community of states that were democratic and wanted to assign responsibility collectively to ensure that democracy within the states of the United States, that we are moving towards living on a globe in which we say collectively <laughs> that we all have the right to live in democratic states and that we have a collective responsibility to support those who have established democratic governments. <coughs> Thank you. Well, we, we, we thank you for, a, I think, a marvelously coherent, <laughs> persuasive presentation of a, of a somewhat controversial position. Uh, on the topic of stolen elections as a native of the city of Chicago, I feel a way of life is threatened. <laughs>
I, I, I once heard John F. Kennedy address a group of Democratic precinct captains, and uh, Sidney Yates was challenging Everett McKinley Dirksen just after uh, he, uh, Kennedy barely beat Nixon. And he said, I've heard an awful lot of things about what you people, pointing to the Democratic precinct captains, supposedly did in this last election. I want you to know one thing. I want you to go out there and do the same thing for Sidney Yates. <laughs> uh, but that's, that's a small dimension of your, your problem. On a, on a serious note, Kim Dae-jung, by the way, gave his last address in the United States, be returning to Korea with some trepidation before the same audience uh, some years ago. And so we've all certainly followed his uh, long and arduous uh, career. Uh, it's been a marvelous presentation. The floor is now open for questions. Two, uh, two related questions. Uh, the first is, in, in 1993, given the groundswell toward democracy which you described, why was the international community's uh, response so lukewarm? And then related to that, um, again, given the groundswell, um, do you really think that a variety of nations will uh, devise and cooperate with eff effective steps against the offending state? Well, I think... Uh some of the critics of American human rights policy argue that that we have a double standard, that we beat up on little countries and not on big countries. Um, and my view is that, to some extent, we do do that. But the people who benefit from that are the little countries that we beat up on, rather than the big countries that we don't beat up on. That is, my view is that beating up on, that is insisting that these countries accept democratic norms, is helping the people of a country and not hurting them. Uh, and the fact that we can't do it in every country doesn't mean we shouldn't do it where we can. Obviously, an invasion of Nigeria is a very much bigger operation than an invasion of Haiti. And I think we have to recognize that that in part depends, determines what we do. Um, I think it is also the case that um, Latin America now, you have a regional consensus about democracy being the only legitimate form of government. You do not yet have that in Africa. I think we're moving rapidly towards that, at least at a verbal level, and you see that in response to the recent military coups. But in 93, you didn't really, it was only beginning to develop in Africa, and therefore, it was harder for the international community uh, to respond. And of course, it's a large country with oil and, and a large military force. But I think that things are changing, and I think the, the passive nature of the response initially in Nigeria is now changing. And if you look at the debate that just took place among the Commonwealth countries, I think unless Nigeria, in fact, moves back rapidly towards conducting a free election and allowing the winner to take office of a genuinely free election, that the movement towards sanctions against the coup plotters and the government as a whole is going to grow. I would think that two years from now, the Commonwealth will be in the Security Council asking for mandatory international sanctions. And I think there's beginning to be an understanding of that in Nigeria. Uh, the question of how do you get a lot of countries to cooperate, I think the answer is you start. Um, and there is there are two movements that are going on here. One is um, the movements that I've already described towards democracy. And the other is the notion of the illegitimacy of the safe havens against international norms in terms of where people can go and in terms of where money can go. And the Swiss have discovered that sort of saying Swiss banks are different, crooks are welcome, is no longer acceptable to the international community. And so are, you know, countries in, uh, in the Caribbean and others who are trying to take over that. And I think what we have to do by creating these institutions and by setting up these structures is to bring pressure to bear on, on these other countries which want to be part of, of the international community to say that, you know, countries which allow coup plotters against democratic governments to send their money there and protect it are not acceptable parts of the international community. And that that is a process that's being built and that we have to support. I do want to say, though, I think one key element here is that the United States has to be willing to accept these rules, too. And part of the problem is that the United States has gone in two directions. One is 
promoting the rule of law and trying to insist that everybody else has to abide by it, and then announcing that none of these rules can apply to the United States. So there is now a debate going on in the American government about the International Criminal Court. And the President has made it clear that the United States supports the creation of an international criminal court. And what many people in the bureaucracy are saying is that's fine as long as we write the rules so that no American can ever be tried by the court. Um, and, you know, the more cynical ones say, well, we can just have a provision in there that says, you know, no country that, you know, had a revolution in 1776 can be subject. <laughs> However they want to write it is fine. We have to be willing to say that if we want to create these international institutions, they have to apply, the rules have to apply to us as to everybody else. And that's a debate I think we need to have in this country uh, because we're not going to get too much further along the path of creating a world governed by a rule of law if our view is the World Trade Organization can tell everybody what to do but not us about Cuba because we're different than everybody else. Would you uh, comment about the various fears that philosophers and statesmen have had about extreme democracy in its various forms, uh, period. Yeah. Yes. Well, I, I usually remember, though I haven't always tonight, to put the word constitutional in front of democracy. Um, but you remember when I talked about the essential elements of a democratic society, they were precisely that there were rules which limited the majority. Uh, and an independent judiciary to enforce those rules. We need to allow political dissent from minorities. We need to allow respect for various kinds of ethnic, racial, religious, and other kinds of minorities within the societies. And we have to have rules that limit the power of, uh, of the government so that what the government of Peru did, where you had an elected, democratically elected president who suspended the parliament through all his political opposition in jail, the OAS responded to that, as I say, not as vigorously, but it took the position correctly that that was as much a sudden interruption of the democratic process as was a threat of a military coup in Paraguay against the government. And I think we have to uh, understand that, that, uh, that power does corrupt and that there is a danger to the democratically elected leaders. Uh, will deny other people their rights, and that that's as much of a threat to democracy as, the, as a military coup. The, the question is, what would you, as President Clinton, uh, say to the President of China uh, concerning about how they might move toward constitutional democracy, presuming that your language might be different than the 92 campaign? And then how would uh, uh, the President of China respond? Well. You know, what I've been talking about this evening is supporting people who have chosen democracy in their own society. Countries that have not chosen democracy and what we ought to do to promote democracy in those countries is, I think, a much more complicated question. And it is even, sorry, and it is even more complicated when you're dealing with a country that has nuclear weapons, whose cooperation is critical to solving security problems throughout the world. Can you not hear me? Can I? Sure. Is this better? You've been missing all the jokes. The, uh, uh, I think there's no simple solution uh, in the case of China. I think we certainly need to make it clear, um, I would say more publicly than in the private conversation, uh, that we, we stand uh, with the people struggling to establish democracy in that country. And I don't think we ought to have any apology for that. Uh, and I think that in international institutions um, like the, U the Commission on Human Rights of the UN, we ought to be much more vigorous than we have been in the last couple of years in seeking to get those institutions to uh, sanction China for its violation of human rights. Uh, at the same time, I think we do have to deal with the government of China on a wide variety of security issues and ought to do so even though we don't, we don't like the government of that country. Now, there are some political prisoners in China, 
sorry, is this the wrong one? Having solved one problem. Oh, I see, I'm moving away from it. There are um, some political prisoners in China uh, who I think we have an obligation to do everything we can to get out of prison. And if I were advising the president now on this, I would urge him to focus the human rights portion of his conversations with the Chinese leadership on securing the release of, from prison of two or three of the leaders of the Chinese democracy movement who seem to be dying, in fact, in Chinese prisons. Um, I would not have agreed to a state visit before those people were released. I think we can deal with a country like China on the merits about proliferation issues, about security issues in, in Asia, and recognize their legitimate security concerns without giving them a banquet. Um, but if we're going to give them a banquet, I think that uh, the president ought to make it very clear uh, that he expects some gesture consistent with the aspirations of the American people, which is that people who have struggled for democracy in that country should not be dying in prisons simply because they believe in democracy. The, the question was, would you describe the process of codification? Yeah, I mean, I'm, this is a, a, a work in progress, but I can tell you my current view on the subject. Um, and this is obviously going to take some time. I don't expect to have it tomorrow. But the idea would be to draft an international covenant, like the covenant against genocide, uh, which would commit the signature countries to take certain specified actions against uh, people who stole a democratic election. And the way the process would work, as I envision it, is if a group of people came to power in a country, whether it was Russia or Albania or Haiti or Korea, and were holding a democratic election, they could choose to invite in observers from either a regional body like the OAS or the UN to observe the election. And if the international observers at the end of the process declared the election, to be a free and fair democratic election and designated somebody as been the winner of the election, that government, when it came to power, could ask for the protection of this covenant. So in effect, there would be two bodies of states. There would be countries who signed it and agreed to support democracies, and then there would be countries that sought its protection. And the the obligations would apply only to countries that sought its protection. So the government of Haiti, the Aristide government, for example, would say, in effect, we fear, fear a military coup. We therefore sign the protocol of this convention that puts us under its jurisdiction. Then if there was either an auto coup or a coup against the democratic government, there would be a complaint brought to the decision-making body of this of the signatures of this covenant. And they would appoint a group of, in effect, judges to hold a hearing to determine whether there had been a coup against the democratic elected government. And if they reached the finding that there had been, then the states that had signed this covenant would be obliged to seize the assets of the coup plotters, to deny them the right to travel, to deny their family the right to travel, deny the children the right to go there and to then meet to decide what are the steps needed to be taken to assure the reversal of the process. And they would then refer to the International Criminal Court this case and suggest that the court indict these people for the crime of stealing a democratic election so that if they traveled outside their territory, there would be an obligation to arrest them and to hold them for trial before a court of the International Criminal Court. So that's sort of um, the basic idea of how uh, this would function. There are obviously <clears throat> a lot of details that would have to be sought through and spelled out in the process. The question is, what is your position with respect to uh, most favored nation treaty status uh, in China? Uh, I am in favor of it. I believe, I mean, that's, of course, a misnomer. MFN is really normal trading relations. I am in favor of it. In fact, I was in the uh, Clinton administration and worked very actively on the decision to uh, break the link between MFN and human rights in China. I thought it was the right thing to do. I still think it's the right thing to do. 
The distinction I would draw between, is between normal trade relations and concessions, uh, assistance. I don't believe we should be giving economic assistance of any kind to any government which is not a democracy. Um, and we have continued to hold back uh, certain kinds of economic assistance programs which was suspended in China at the time of Tiananmen. My hope is the President will not agree to end those during this visit, although I fear that there are pressures to do that, and the Chinese are pressing very hard to do that. Uh, I do not believe we should offer the Chinese any kind of concessional assistance. I believe that they should be permitted to come into the World Trade Organization if they meet the economic standards and accept the economic obligations, so that I would not exclude them from that, again, the normal trade patterns. Um, because of their lack of democracy and respect for human rights, but I would not grant them any special concessions. I think it is in fact the case that over the long period, bringing states into the international community, exposing them to democracy, undermines dictatorship. I think we need to remember um, that it was Stalin who imposed the Iron Curtain, not the West. That we believed, as Stalin believed, that communism could not survive if there was trade and discourse with the West. And he put down that Iron Curtain because he understood that these ideas were infectious, that the trade was infectious. And I think he was right, and uh, I think we've seen the history of that. Um, that doesn't mean it's going to happen quickly, and it doesn't mean it's the only thing we ought to do, but I think we ought to recognize that trade, that intercourse, that exchanges of people does help to contribute uh, to spreading uh, democracy around the world. But at the same time, I think we need to deny concessional trade and assistance to non-democratic countries, and we ought to not hesitate to speak out. The Chinese have always said we should separate our views about human rights from our dealings with them on other issues. I think that's right, but that's a two-way street. It means we should continue to say what we think and say in seek sanctions in international bodies appropriate international bodies about their human rights record. Now, we can't do that, and then when somebody shows up here to ask about the death penalty, we say, go away, it's, you're not supposed to do that in our society. We have to be willing, as I've said, to do it in our own society as well. But I think that uh, we can deal with China as a country, we can deal with its legitimate security interests so that we don't get into war. We tried a trade embargo with China, as you may remember, for a very long time didn't produce democracy, um, and that it is possible to walk on those two tracks. We had, we had chatted earlier, and I said, inevitably, he will answer a question. The, the question is, how would you apply what you're, you're thinking about to the Kurd population? That is a different subject, and I've actually written a book about that subject called National Self-Determination in the New World Order. I think that there is a very different very hard set of questions about what you do about situations where there is no agreement on the boundaries of the country. Everything I've said so far is about situations where, you know, everybody agrees Haiti is within these borders. What do you do about coups in that territory? I think, you know, to give you the short answer that David Sheffer and I lay out in this book is that the attitude of the international community ought to be a presumption for existing borders, but only if it's accompanied by democracy and a heavy emphasis on autonomy and various kinds of manifestation of self-determination short of a government by people like the Kurds who feel, clearly feel they have a separate identity. And that the international community ought to reach a point in some of these situations where it says to the countries, you have not lived up to those obligations. You are not allowing these people to express themselves in appropriate ways, and therefore we are going to support the independence and the establishment of a new democratic society in those countries. But those questions are much harder and much more complicated. Well, for a discussion of a topic that's very much at the heart of, I think, current American foreign policy, uh, we're delighted that we've had such a uh, one of the, the nation's leading authorities on the question. It was very good of you to take your time to be with us this evening, and we're in your debt for that. Thank you My very pleasure. much. Thank you.